Whether your beer is in a bottle, can, or glass, kick back and relax. It's Better on Draft. Welcome, everybody, to the Michigan Beer Series of Better on Draft Podcast, episode number 40. My name is Ken. Thank you so much for joining us. I truly appreciate it. It is Friday. It is gorgeous outside, apparently, for everyone, as I'm seeing all of this beautiful, regular daylight. Uh, Let's go around and see what everybody is drinking, starting with Wendy. Wendy, what do you got over there? Um, Since I am in beautiful Gladwin, I stopped and picked up a couple of semi-local uh, i got black rocks coconut brown and um also black rounds my kiss AP- ipa Ooh, i like that yeah jan what are you drinking over there so since nick isn't here i thought i'd you know double fist today because why the hell not um from Ren House, i've got a joe max coffee stout and keeping with the coffee theme i've got a 12 west brewing midnight run Nice. Well, for myself, I am going to be uh, pulling a Nick as well. I've got from Arctic Circle Brewing the Juneteenth 2023, as well as a uh, old style to wash it down. Okay. And lastly, to wash <laughs> all of that down, I have a Hoplark Hop Tea. The tea is silent, so caffeine free, uh, as it is getting a little late, and I want to make sure I get my beauty to rest today. But we have a guest. <laughs> With us tonight, uh, we have Arctic Circle Brewing out of Chesterfield, Michigan. Uh, why don't you guys say hello, introduce yourself, and tell us what you guys do with the brewery. All right, uh, I'll start out. This is Eric. I am kind of the uh, operations guy uh, behind the scenes doing all the, the fun stuff that needs to get done in order to keep things running. Yeah, like does all the uh, dirty work that gets none of the glory. He is the <laughs> backboard to this company, uh, and I am Devin. I am the uh, head brewer and uh, the, the the boots on the floor day to day guy, you know. Uh, and uh, I guess we're also having some beer, so we are. Uh, I, I will be having my uh, first Juneteenth of the year as well. Uh, and for Eric, and I've got the Green Eyed Bandit, our blonde ale with clover honey and green tea. Yes, sir. Well, before we catch up on the last two and a half years since you've been on the show, why don't you tell me uh, about this Juneteenth 2023 beer? What am I drinking? Um, and give us a little bit of a rundown of the uh, the beer itself and why you made it. Uh, so, like, uh, when we were uh, closing in on our opening, um, it was uh, one, like, I, I wanted a a bold statement to go into the grand opening of the brewery. And uh, as we were creep- creeping closer to it, it was uh, apparent to us that the uh, Juneteenth uh, was going to become a national holiday. So uh, as it uh, inevitably ended up getting approved, uh, we already had a beer in the kettle for it. So um, this series of beers, we get released once a year. And for us, uh, I wanted to keep it rotating as far as a flavor profile goes. Like, the first one was a hit, um, and many of people asked for it a uh, year since. And however, I wanted to change the flavor profile profile for it because it was uh, one, and I think it shouldn't stay stagnant, but but will ever be uh, kind of um, uh, ever present. So this year's is a ten percent uh, stout that uh, we brewed to be more of a robust profile and using uh, roasted cocoa nibs from tanzania and madagascar vanilla beans as well so you get that balance of uh, roasty chocolate versus the vanilla sweetness as well and uh yeah who doesn't love a stout as the weather's getting nice and beautiful (laughs) right peak summertime and it's one of those like i'm always like surprised by the response that we have for like always those well stouts season is every season yeah if there could be an ipa season Yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah, no, that, that's why we do it. It's uh, it's a beer for us that is definitely mm-hmm. a it, classic. It, it carries well. And actually, like, uh, earlier uh, today, I was on the phone uh, with uh, gentleman Mark, uh, co-owner down at uh, Ailmatic in Ohio, and they'll be doing a uh, bit of a Juneteenth tap takeover. So it will be the only place that we'll be actually distributing this uh, beer this year will be down in uh, just outside of Dayton, Ohio. Is Elmatic Brewing Co. and they'll be uh, featuring this uh, Juneteenth 2023. Which uh, so shout out to them and uh, look for that if you happen to be watching this and down in the uh, 
Ohio Dayton, area. Dayton, Ohio area. Definitely a little hike, not as close as maybe Toledo uh, or some other cities within the state <laughs> of Michigan. With that in mind, um, you guys have been open for two and a half years since you were last on the show. And one of the things you talked about a lot, Devin, with the brewing and the beer that you were making, that you wanted to do a lot of coffee beers. Uh, Coffee beers were the kinds of things that you really hammered into. Is that something that you guys achieved or did you stray away? How did the business plan move from that uh, part of the business making beers? So we uh, kind of lean into it even more than what we uh, kind of spoke about initially. Uh, we have an entire series called Breakfast In, and then you plug in a city or a country that inspires that beer. And honestly, one of like the uh, biggest beers that's come from it is our Breakfast in New Orleans, which we like built an entire release around just based off this idea. We wanted a coffee-influenced ale that uh, kind of uh, finds inspiration from the place that we've kind of found it from. So, uh, yeah, no, coffee beers uh, for us is still a ever-present thing. Like, for Eric, like, he doesn't drink coffee, but coffee beers... Coffee Coffee beers, I'm on board. I mean, it's it's an interesting concept. I mean, even, you know, talking to things like uh, we did a cream ale with uh that steeped you know uh like a fruity coffee note in yeah, the, it just Ethiopian added a little bit coffee, Ethiopian bean. coffee yeah and yeah so i mean it's something that even if it's not ever so prominent trying to get a little bit of that flavor mm-hmm. infused into some of the beers well talk to us what's happened the last two and a half years how have things progressed what is going on within the brewery itself yeah, I mean, obviously for us, you know, uh, approaching two years, our two year anniversary celebration will be just in a couple of weeks. Um, so, yeah, a little bit surreal. I mean, we've definitely uh, done a lot in terms of, well, I should say, uh, uh, the artiste over here doing a lot of uh, decor updates throughout, adding some, you know, just some more notes to to make the brewery itself feel more homey. Um, kind of get that neighborhood, you know, that kind of basement esque feel that we kind of always wanted where you come in, you feel comfortable, you want to stay for a while, have some beers. Um, so yeah, no, for us, I mean, things have, uh, things have progressed. I, you know, obviously we've changed a lot, you know, over the two years. Yeah. yeah, And like, uh, it was one thing that for us, uh, in that first year of opening, we, um, knew that as as home brewers we had no experience in actual working inside of a craft uh beer place uh we had ideas but we didn't know what would resonate with people so in that first 365 days uh we just put out a bunch of different beers and just kind of were looking for what people were responding to and uh, what like came from that in the past two years is and it's like one of the biggest things we do annually now, and it's uh, com- almost like a uh, 60 to 90 day thing is our Sour Magazine Day. It has uh, become a placeholder and shout out to our bar manager, Sean, who kind of birthed this idea. It was yeah. uh, uh, if you guys seen the movie uh, Billy Madison, uh, Nudie Magazine Day. I was going to say it, you said it the exact same way he says it. Magazine <laughs> day. When, yeah, when, yeah. when Norb tells him it's uh, August or October or whatever the, the yeah, day is. Even What's today? Oh, it's Nudie Magazine. It's Nudie Magazine Day. And so, like, uh, and he mentioned it was like, cause like, sours for us had always like uh, been one that like moved the needle pretty well. And we figured, like, all right, let's just make a day around it. And like the past uh, three or four that we've done have turned into an escalating like uh, appearance inside the tap house with people. And like, uh, I think we've uh, gone as far up as like 10 sour beers released in one day which is logistically a nightmare. Try to like yeah. one, find all the ideas for it and then two, executing them at a, like a high level. So uh, when you ask like in the last two years, like air speaks to like the atmosphere and it growing and like evolving. And then secondarily, the beer itself, trying to find a, a, a space that responds to what the people want. And like the coffee beers, the sour beers and uh, a couple of staples that we found over time. Kind of speaks to that yeah yeah you can't forget the lawnmower beers i mean i think that's the biggest thing <laughs> chesterfield i mean we see it with our friends starcraft up in richmond mm-hmm. same thing you know we're uh we're in an area they they love their uh their light beers their lawnmower beers so yeah just kind of to devin's point framing uh the tap list in a way that kind of resonates well with the audience yeah. 
with Chesterfield, you had an idea and a vision of what you felt being the first brewery in Chesterfield, what people would be drinking there as you started your brewery. What has changed? What is the clientele out there that you're getting at 23 and Gratiot? So, like, it took us a little while to get into the lager space. Um, like, as a home brewer who didn't have all the uh, necessities to create such a beer, it would, uh, took me a little time to even, like, build confidence to get inside of that uh, atmosphere, right? But uh, once we got there, uh, like, our Coast de Four Nine was one of, like, the first entry points to a lager beer. And um, once we put that on the menu, it was clear to us, like, okay, it's uh, it has to be here and it has to have an ever presence for us. Um, so, like, versus, like, what we were expecting the people to respond to, it was there. Um, it almost took me as a brewer to, like, even find the ability to execute that at a level that I was, like, confident to give it to the people, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, like, Loggers are those uh, beers that are making a resurgence, one, and then two, like, it's not just fashionable, but, like, people appreciate a artisanal lager, which I really, really, like, want to, like, stand and applause the audience because it is something that, like, is underappreciated with what the work and labor that goes into it, you know? Uh, and uh, honestly, like, with what we have on like the other side of it as far as like uh, and i almost want to classify this as like added drunk driven beers we do a, a a large amount of that like our tuesday beta test turned into thursday beta test just because we close on tuesdays <laughs> and people still want it small batch stupid beers like earlier this week we just released a farmhouse ale that was based off the idea we had a strawberry moon earlier this week. And I saw that on the calendar. It only happens every 20 years. So why not put out a farmhouse ale with strawberry that's uh, uh, paired with the uh, flavor profile of a moon pie, you know? So it's finding that balance between traditional Chesterfield drinking habits and our uh, kind of creative side that people kind of come to know us for. So I have not had a chance to actually visit your site, um, but I have gotten to have your beer and I'm a big fan. Um, what, uh, what would you say to people who have never been there, why they should come visit your taproom? Uh, we are unique because, and this is something that's kind of taken me personally, like I don't think I've actually really expressed this to my uh, good friend, best friend, <laughs> business partner, Eric. I reside in a very unique space in this industry. I'm a black kid from the west side of Detroit, and it took me a little while to even embrace that sort of idea in the sense of I wanted to make beer for the masses, but we're in Chesterfield and not a lot of people kind of relate to my sort of experience. Um, so me like if uh, you're open to the idea of someone who has lived in the west side of detroit lived in tuscaloosa alabama lived in the suburbs of uh the city itself i try to present beer in an approachable way um uh, but also not forget about who i am as like an individual in the translation of that uh well pouring from the glass and handing to the customer sort of sense so yeah, like I, I want beer to be a non uh, sort of uh, discriminatory thing in the sense of I'm a snowflake, no pun intended in this industry. And I want beer to not be this exclusive thing. And I want to be a spokesperson for that. So what do I want from it? I want people to see us and see the balance between everything. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. I think it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, obviously, like you said, I mean, Chesterfield, you know, we, we wanted to bring what, who we are and have that come through regardless of, of what that means. Um, you know, just to Devin's point, like who he is and where he's from, you know, from, from our standpoint saying, Hey, you know what, we're going to stand up for what we believe in. And, you know, including we've launched, 
Uh, we launched it at the beginning part of this year, but our giving back tap. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea that, you know, we rotate through charities every two, three months kind of just rotates um, and different things that are important to us. So whether it's, you know, we did an animal charity, um, we just got done, wrapped up uh, supporting the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. I have Crohn's. So for me, it's something that hits close to home. Uh, coming up here, we're going to be doing a set of charities for each of our different um, servers and, and our bar manager across the board as each of them kind of picked a charity. And we're going to say hey, for the next three months, this is what we're supporting. So I think regardless of, you know, what goes on in or out, you know, Devin and I are bringing what we want to bring to the brewery. And that's what we want people to see when they come. Right. It's like personalizing the experience. Like we don't want to be faceless within the transaction. It's a, uh, I don't know. Uh, communal experience is, is shouldn't just be beer and cash. It should yep. be person to person, you know? And that's fantastic. That's yeah, definitely yeah. what I look for when I go to a brewery. Well, that's um, what makes so, us unique for sure. Yeah. Have you found the community has been very supportive of that? Yeah. I, I mean, I would say so. I mean, I think, you know, from, from our standpoint, especially, especially from the charity angle, um, I let her out here, but she's crazy. I adopted a dog from the animal charity that we had out. We, uh, you know, we hosted a dog adoption event, you know, got four dogs, including the one that I took home, um, adopted, um, you know, other different types of events, I think. And it's even people that Devin and I know maybe personally that whether we went to high school with or other things that are like, Hey, I'm really glad that you're, you know, you're doing this or you're supporting this because it's something that it's close to home for me. And we didn't know that as, as somebody who, even if we've known them for many years. So right. I think it's something that that's what we want people to see. And I feel like it is resonating. And like, uh, I think, uh, and this is a really personal thing from my experience is uh, being a black brewer. I've run into some sort of pushback here and there, but like in a grand scheme of things, uh, being accepted across the board is one of those where like it's refreshing from the sense like Chesterfield can sometimes have the wrong sort of outlook on its people. But uh, what we've been able to curate in, in our own personal tap room and the give back stuff that Eric has uh, contributed to is one of those things like I feel like incredibly proud of. Like it's not just this uh, space with chairs and uh, decent beer. It's something that speaks more about the people that patron the place than it does about the actual uh, area itself. And as we, I don't know, in hopes of my own, like I think that we can continue to grow and do that outreach stuff that can be positive outreaching and, uh, I don't know, opinion changing. That's awesome. So we have a uh, pretty wide range of um, experience amongst our view our viewers or listeners, I guess. <laughs> um, <but laughs> a little bit, <bug, laughs> right? So you guys are two years in now, or just about. And do you have any um, speed bumps that you ran into that you would like to give advice to somebody new coming into the business? So I will say what we are what in, in the uh, overarching of this uh, storyline, we are four years into this idea. Like we yeah. signed a lease agreement in 2019, 2019 yeah. and life turned upside down for us, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously that's something that you can't, you can't prepare for a once in a, a century uh, type event. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think across the board, it's just, especially, you know, if you don't have you know, to Devin's earlier point, talking about it's the first time that either of us ever worked in a setting like this, whether it's serving beer, running a business, um, to his brewing uh, at a large scale. I mean, all the stuff that we never did. Um, I do think, you know, obviously, shout out to all the local breweries that have helped us along the way. I think that that's a, a really big thing. You know, the the community is strong. And I think that's the biggest thing to note when coming in is it's like, hey, definitely you know, work with the other local breweries, accept the help because mm -hmm. they've all been there and they all want to give back. And we've done the same thing um, as well. So having some discussions with these guys and trying to figure out, you know, what's needed in terms of, yeah, helping out, helping out friends. In the, like in the area sense, uh, we also like, uh, we do, and I want to give a shout out to them because uh, Chesterfield has their second brewery coming, uh, Tombstone Brewing Co. Uh, 
and like he stopped into our uh, tap room. Uh, I think it was um, St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Day, and it was uh, one of those like refreshing moments. Like we had heard whisperings about someone coming in locally and trying to do another uh, brewery tap room, and sure enough, it was uh, a uh, a moment for us to answer questions that we had been asking ourselves. So like one thing we can uh, say to someone who's listening that is looking to do the same thing we did possibly, or just like interested in the actual business itself, like this industry is built on a lot of good people and a lot of good people are willing to share their story and help you along in the process. And so when he, he showed up in our tap room and Eric spoke to him for a gr- much greater length than I did, yeah. um, it was a welcome the moment because it felt like uh, for the first time almost to us that we were able to try to give back to someone that we had been imparted from so many other people opportunity you know so before i pass it on to dan i'm going to ask is there um something that has happened along the way that you did not expect to happen but we're really excited about uh that's a good question I think for me on like my, my side of the business, it is just learning what the people would respond to. Uh, beer wise, like uh, uh, as home brewers, we pretty much found a niche of fun based off of brewing beer that no one else would do. Uh, opening a business requires to brew beer for not just us, but for everybody. So um, doing that and then uh, kind of listening to the response for it was kind of like my biggest takeaway from it all. And then secondarily, uh, location like Chesterfield is great. They, uh, there were the people respond to it and they support us uh, very well. However, um, we could probably have found an even better location in Chesterfield itself yeah. uh, in hindsight, right? Like, um, you know, strip malls have supported breweries across the corner, uh, across the country. However, like uh, not every strip mall is created equal. So those fail points within that strip mall experience, I think should be further looked into whether it be your neighbors or your ability for food trucks or even the simplest things of a patio right like uh you know like we have an ability to put a patio in however like you have a beautiful view of target and bell tire yeah (laughs) so you gotta kind of like uh, pinpoint those things within growth so like uh i think for me personally i can't speak for air on this one but like I know that maybe like uh, we could have found a different uh, strip mall inside of uh, Chesterfield that could have accommodated uh, our space a little bit better. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, obviously, yeah, like you said, things that you learn along the way. I mean, when we were first looking at properties, it was pre the world turning upside down. Um, So, you know, you're looking at limited space and money is money. And then COVID happens and all of a sudden lots of places open up and you can get real estate commercially really cheap. So, um, you know, I mean, but obviously, I mean, everything happens for a reason We're, you know, we are where we are for a reason and, you know, we'll continue to, you know, to grind at it and, uh, you know, do everything we can to get people to, uh, find our strip mall. Um, you know, in beautiful chess. It's like the littlest things, right? Like, uh, this is like an inside baseball mm-hmm. thing for us. Like, uh, we signed our lease agreement and then like months later we had inquired about putting our logo on the very, very large intersection of 23 and Gratiot, our Boulevard sign. And they were like, Oh no, you have to negotiate that inside of your lease agreement. Yep. I'm like, well, why not bring that into conversation when we're doing it? Like, yeah, no, sorry, oh, we didn't own the business before. Why not? Never uh, done, <laughs> yeah, never done lease agreements, thrown together like contracts and stuff like. It's just, yeah, it's all it's all new things and stuff that you don't normally think about. But yeah, I mean, would have been fantastic to have it on that giant sign right underneath that big Target right, uh, right bullseye, next, right, right next right to next Target to bullseye. bullseye. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So first off, got a fun question for you guys. Um, first off, is the couch still a thing? And if so, why aren't you sitting on it right now? Good question. We, Touché. Yeah, we talked we talk the, the, the couch is still a thing. It exists. People sit on it all day, every day. Um, 
we, we had some discussions about it. We were fearful for audio issues of being in the tap room on a Friday night, uh, trying to do something on the, uh, the couch. Um, I know we did, um, an interview, I don't know, probably like four or five months ago. And it was like the same thing. We're doing it in February on a Saturday night. It's like the tap room's full. <laughs> We're like running in between doing things to like try to help like, oh, a keg blue and you're like running out. And so I, we figured this was the easiest way for us to be able to sit and have a conversation. But the tap, uh, but the tap room still has two couches. One of them is in the employee lounge employee area. and the other one is inside the actual tap room. So like, uh, and that is the weirdest thing. Like uh, I like mentioned to Eric during the build out, like we need a blue couch. Like this would work great for, cause we couldn't do like pop-ups at breweries and whatnot during the shutdown. So like uh went on Facebook marketplace and we found a hundred dollar uh, pre-used velvet couch. It has a blue velvet, man. <laughs> and it like took on a life of its own. So yeah, like when you asked about it, like uh, as we were getting closer to the opening of the brewery, it was like, yeah, like this couch is okay, but like we probably shouldn't have the same one that we were building a brewery around for nine months in the tap room because you can give a good smack to a cushion and it's going to permeate plastic. To this, to this day, it still has that that feel to it. It's been two years. And like that, that that original one, we take it to beer festivals. Like we did uh, Burning Foot last summer out in uh, Muskegon, and that thing was a fixture. We were having a hard time getting people off of it. <laughs> <laughs> exist and, uh, Walking in that sand is so hard that I think if you didn't bring your own lawn chair, like <laughs> oh, my, it was the worst. <laughs> yeah, we we interviewed um, the previous president of the Brewers Guild um, for the Lakeshore Brewers Guild, of course, not the Michigan, but the Lakeshore Brewers Guild before the festival, and that was not a warning he gave us. Like I was, I I think there is some some rules for that festival that should have been told to everyone. Uh, including make sure you bring your own chair because you're going to yeah. want it and try to walk all, all over that uh, uh, beach. Sorry, Dan. No, you're totally okay. Um, so, David, this one's for you. This one, I want to go back to the, you know, whole being a snowflake in the beer industry, and it really is true. Um, we had, you know, Rob on the show, longtime host, who said, for example, he could go to a beer festival, you know, and count, you know, people like him on one hand, basically. Um and for example, here, I don't know the numbers in Michigan, but here, for example, in Arizona, where I'm at, there's one black owned brewery um, that where he's also the brewer and one uh, other black brewer uh, out of the hundred plus breweries that we have. Um, so tell me, what do you think the issue is with getting African-Americans involved in the craft beer community and what can we do to fix that? I don't think it's so much as like an issue. <clears throat> so craft beer got its uh surges behind people that don't look like us and ultimately like anything else uh is going to take individuals like myself to uh create inside of that industry to then have it seem like a space that we are welcomed in right as if like we're not you can go anywhere and uh your experience can be uh, a, a good one however I mean, founders excluded. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, I think that it is important to, uh, I don't know, uh, be face forward as who I am with uh, doing anything that we do beer wise, right? So um, music didn't uh, get its um, surgeons off of black people, but we are big contributors of it. Uh, food doesn't get a surgeons off of uh, people look at me, but we're a part of it. So across the board, I think that being face forward and a, in this type of climate, a personality almost goes even further than just a product itself. So um, yeah, I think that we are kind of in a space where until someone starts doing it, it doesn't make sense for anyone else that looks like. Them. Yeah, that's a fair statement too. It's kind of that it feels almost like a catch 22, you know, it's, you know, someone's got to be the first to do it, but it almost feels like, ever, you know, people are scared to do it or try to branch out. So it really does. It, it is kind of a difficult situation. Hopefully we can change it. You know, it's glad to have people like you uh, reaching out and trying to make that better because beer is for everyone. So I always love seeing it because the more people we get involved, the better. 
Dan, um, before now, we get off yeah. the topic, um, I just want to make sure, uh, I don't know if uh, Devin was going to mention it, there was the launch this year of the National Black Brewers Association, um, which is a a group of, obviously, black brewers, um, you know, lobbying, promoting, uh, doing their part to be inclusive within the industry. And I think hearkening back to the conversation we had with Julia Hers of the American Home Brewers Association, um, while not uh, black brewers, but female brewers, people who are female within the industry, um, trying to get out and instead of going to where the beer drinkers are, going to where everyone else is to bring them in as beer drinkers is an important selling point within the industry itself. Because if you go to where the beer drinkers are, you're going to get people who look like me, uh, bald, fat, bearded, well, not wearing flannel today, but you know, that's I'm, I'm the atypical. Like if you look at me, you're like, Oh, that dude probably drinks craft beer, especially if I'm wearing my red flannel. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing where you need to go to, not where the beer drinkers are, but where the beer drinkers could be. And Julia Hers made the comment of saying, you know, you need to go to um, college campuses where they're doing the, you know, on the the campus, on the streets, and they're promoting, telling people, hey, you know, home brewers club. You're not promoting to beer drinkers. You're promoting to a wide variety of people who don't necessarily know that they're a um, you know, minority, major minority within the industry. Um, because black representation does not match U.S. representation of black people within the country. Um, so I wanted to make sure to get all of that out. And with Michigan, Dan, we have four Black Fire, 734, Black Calder, and Arctic Circle. I don't know if there's any others, but those are the four I could come up with off the top of my head. Yeah, and like, uh, again, like it is uh, one of those, like, I truly believe that it's going to catch up. Like, uh, I have a 20 year old younger brother uh he doesn't drink under uh any uh understanding that i have however like he is surrounded by people that understand and think highly of the craft beer culture and they also look like him so like it's this uh separate generational thing and also it is a sort of uh representation thing so like once i sort of make an appearance i then plant five more seeds that can possibly grow 10 more plants right so i look at it as uh, i can do as much uh community outreach as i can um but it won't go as far as my hands in the kettle will right like uh being faced for with a company that uh resides in the industry that skews one way it doesn't make a difference until we actually kind of uh, start to do some of the uh, creativity things ourselves. That's why, like, you're drinking, uh, he's drinking the Green Eyed Bandits, named after something from hip hop reference. Juneteenth is, for some people, polarizing, but uh, ultimately it's just another holiday. And yeah. so, yeah, man, like, it's uh, for me, it's an experience imparted on industry. And no one can do it more than someone who has the ability to create their own. Yep. Great point. Now I want to go ahead and shift the focus a little bit here. Um, so I'm taking a look at your menu. I have not unfortunately been there. I haven't been able to get out there uh, yet. The times that I have been in Michigan since you opened, um, you do have a lot of darker and heavier beers. I noticed, do you have a barreling barrel aging program currently? We're just getting into that. Yeah. Um, so like, I want to give like a big thanks to like our good friend, Jeff over at Loaded Dice. Like uh, he is one of my, our best friends in the industry. Yeah. And he's put us in contact with many of people who are trying to uh, help us with that barrel program. And with that being said, yes, uh, we've got a couple of barrels sitting in the back of the brew house right now that will be a part of our um, drum roll, please. <sighs> We will be doing a breakfast in release for the uh, National Stout Day uh, come November, right? Like, uh, so we're going to, and this will be no spoiler for any of our followers that are actually, uh, you know, in the tap room day to day, but breakfast in Chesterfield is coming. Oh, uh, breakfast yep. in Chester, Tucky. <laughs> Chester, Tucky. <laughs> um, I feel like that's just for my birthday. So thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. We, Wendy, I'll Wendy, save a can, couple cans for you, Wendy. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, breakfast in Cheshire Tucky is coming. So it'll be a barrel aged Imperial Stout and some bourbon barrels, you know. And yeah, uh, and this speaking to like my brewing sort of experience, I I had to call in a lot of favors just to like learn how to fill a keg or fill a barrel, excuse me. Uh, it was one of those. I'm like, I, I don't want this nine, 10, 12, 11 month experience to go to waste. Right. So when it's sitting there, aging, it's like, I got to make sure this thing gets filled correctly. So ended up, uh, you know, calling in some favors to get that barrel filled properly. And now like, yeah, in November, we'll be uh, releasing our full, full first full run on some bourbon barrels. And I'm like super excited. Breakfast in Cheshire, Tucky. <laughs> Love the name. I used to live out there back in 2000, so I know absolutely where that name comes from. <laughs> so, uh, so you've, you're <laughs> you're into the barreling now, so or the barrel aging now. So, is there then uh, plans to transition into sours? Yeah, no. Like uh, we were saying earlier, like a sour magazine day. We'll be. Uh, uh, I think it'll be the last Saturday in July yeah. will be our next Sour Magazine Day, which will be uh, our fifth Sour Magazine Day, but yeah. technically the sixth one because we did a two and a half. So we we're in the middle. Or... We did a little halfer because I was like, only four sours. What's people going to do with four <laughs> sours? <laughs> so, yeah, no, so we're, we're big on sours. Uh, that is honestly some of the most popular stuff we do. And I've uh, called in a couple of favors as well for that one. So I'm thinking uh, we could have a couple collabs lined up for that future release in late July. Are these kettle sours that you're putting out or are these traditional? No, so I haven't done the kettle sour since like the uh, first like three yeah. months of us being open. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I uh, pitched sour yeast. It's just uh, easier for us in our actual brew system. So I have an open top uh, brew kettle and trying to keep it at temperature for 48 hours to uh, uh, properly sour inside of a kettle is a difficult one. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, we ended up switching over to uh, Lala Maid's uh, Philly Sour or and recently came on the scene was uh, Apex Cultures, which they uh, do a sour pitch. It's a dual pitch. You uh, initially pitch it just to drop your pH and then secondarily you can pitch it again to uh, do a fermentation cycle off of it but i end up switching over to like a, a british five like a, your standard uh new england ipa pitch for the fruity characters because people love the fruity sours <laughs> they seem to love them everywhere i'm personally not a fan but man so many people they're almost up there with ipas it feels like um as far as that goes um, yeah, what is, like uh, actually before I got before we go to the next question so like I yeah. just uh, we just put out earlier today a pitch to our social media following uh we're gearing up for our next sour magazine day we need ideas we need ideas like uh yeah. we, we, we release a lot of sours in one day and we are only two people <laughs> you have a sour beer idea for us <laughs> yeah we got Got to think of some unique sours we could throw to you now just to come up with random kind of things that like actually uh, trans <laughs> like come up. Can you make like milk sours? Can like you can have a milk stout? Of course. We've done yeah. it. We've, we've, You've we've done, done it. Once, uh, sour stout. And <laughs> it, it, it went really well. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I just had a sour from Two Tides that had a um, coffee in it. And it was delicious. It was just a little bit of coffee, so you just got a little bit of the flavor. But I think it really brought out the tropical fruits. What was was like? There any like actual fruit in that one? Because like uh, I've had one. Oh, by yeah. Keller. It was like uh, raspberry and coffee. I'm like, that's fire! Like I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. But it was definitely wanted... it had like it tasted more like a um, a smoothie than a actual beer, Ooh. but it was so good. The tropical fruits just kind of smacked you in the face when you opened it but that coffee i think gave it the edge nice. okay. what about what about doing a line of uh sour cocktail sour beers like a sidecar or a whiskey sour or um you know you could probably bad idea. get four four or six of them out of just those uh, uh so those. margarita obviously is an easy one but 
the most polarizing beer I think we've ever made. Like, uh, came on our Sour Magazine Day number two. We put out a raspberry, tomato, yeah. lime, and sriracha sour. Oh, jeez. There were some people that had on their flight that take a sip of it, and they're like, this is the worst thing I've ever had. It tastes too much like Bloody Mary. And then there was others who was like, there were like three of them. Yeah, like, can I get like three of these and tulips? And also, you have these cans, right? <laughs> uh, like, I want to take that idea and actually uh, source a tequila barrel for someone because, like, I feel like only way to one up yeah, that gotta, sour yeah, ale that. is to drop it inside of a tequila barrel. So, drawing uh, <laughs> your question in from earlier about barrel program and going forward, it's like, if Sour Magazine Day is going to be a staple, it's like, yeah, we got to go and source a, uh, a tequila barrel just so we could drop a sour in it and then just, <laughs> just hit it with a bunch of tomato and raspberry. <laughs> <laughs> so one final question I'm going to pass back to Ken here. Um, I want to throw back to the uh, beta test beers that you do. Um, do you have an example or one you want to talk about that just didn't turn out, just kind of ended up being a really bad beer that you weren't happy with? What do I start? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> I mean, when you when you get as odd and wacky and out there as as we go, they like, to Devin's point, a lot of them can be very polarizing, right? I mean, we get some, you know, where people will try it. I think the one that was probably um, I remember the, the velvet uh, beats. Oh yeah, that one was pretty pol. Like there was a couple people that liked it, but most people were like. Mm -mm. All right, no so beats. we made this beer called a Velvet Beats. It was a uh, imperial stout that uh, I added beets to the mash, and then conditioned with red velvet cake, and <laughs> and also cream cheese. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was a lot. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, was, it was out there. It was a lot. Uh, there was a couple people that was like that was really good, and there was. By and large, everyone said it was terrible, and like I stand by that one. Like, and it's but it's also one of those beers. I'm like, I could probably do that better. I could probably use a little less uh, beets in it because it was <laughs> incredibly earthy and vegetative. Yeah. Heavy, <laughs> heavy beets, heavy on the beets. Very vegetative. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, everything you said had my attention, so I'll watch for the next one to come out. Yeah. yeah like, apparently, uh, you have to make it for Wendy now. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I am a big fan Honestly, of velvet cake. That's what we're looking for is like uh, people's feedback on a lot of these things. Like a lot of our uh, menu often is scaled up from beta test nonsense. Uh, so, so, yeah, like give me feedback. Like, yeah, if, like I don't hit the mark on the first iteration of it. We can go back and revise it. That's what it's there for. It's a small batch. It's 10 gallons. Let's do it. Get rid of it. And then we'll double back later. Um, and, yeah, that is uh, a beer that <laughs> to Eric's point, like it has so much potential <laughs> but just it has so much potential yeah well i want to talk about beer with potential because you i actually poured for arctic circle brewing at the bruisology beer festival over in detroit michigan thank you. Oh, thank you. and there was a beer that was easily the talk of the festival which is your hawaiian sour cakes yeah. Which, as I'm looking at your uh, site right now on Untapped, I'm not seeing anybody drinking it within the last few months. Is this going to be a yearly release, a uh, constant release? Because I feel like you can't give somebody that good of a beer and then take it away. Well, yeah, I mean, knowing knowing what we know now, I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to be something that is going to peak its way back in at some point. Yeah, sure. like uh, I th I think it's fair to assume that I'll be a part of Sour Magazine Day Five. <laughs> like it is uh, what are like I I thought guava was like a novelty fruit, and uh, it turned out really well. Like like Eric was telling me about it with you guys his experience there at the. Um, a beer festival and like it was the sour and like the cider that did the best for us yep. and uh so yeah like i think we probably need to bring back the hawaiian sour cakes <laughs> yeah i was telling everyone who was coming up they were asking me what my favorite beer my beer selection of choice was and i was trying to hawk that baltic porter for you guys i <laughs> love that beer yeah so yeah. much He's like, no, come on guys <laughs> drink some porter <laughs> I remember that was the last thing we had left. And, and we were like, we had everything packed up. And Ken's just like, does anybody want any porter? And you had these like flocking drunk people ready to just take what's left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of, that was easily one of my favorite festivals to serve at. One, because there was no tokens, as I was talking to Devin earlier about. But two, oh, yeah. um, 
there was a lot of it was a different crowd. It was adults who wanted to get out um, and just try something new. It wasn't beer snobs. It wasn't, you know, they, they were there, but the people who were there were interested in just about everything. You know, it was very easy to hawk a Baltic Porter when they just said, what do you like? What do you, you know? Oh, I don't want something that's too heavy. I'm like, this is not heavy at all. Right, yeah, they just see work. dark and they think heavy, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I think that was probably from an audience standpoint, um, very refreshing. Cause it's like, you have these people come up and, you know, yeah, like we said, the cider, I mean, people are trying that. They're like, oh my gosh, I don't even like ciders and I like this. And I'm like, see, that's, that's the whole point is festivals like that are good you know, to get, now it's not all beer snobs. It's the people that are entry level or maybe just want to do something fun. Cause it's a science center. I mean, it can't not be fun. Well, you did serve a Baltic Porter there, Devin, when we had you on the show last time, I believe you said your favorite style is an ESB. Uh, at least it was at that time. Are you still making styles that aren't necessarily, I don't want to say profitable, but big famous you know catchy flashy triple new england ipas like are those styles still coming into the brewery uh yeah a couple of weeks ago we just released our uh belgian bandit um so just like a uh, offshoot of the green eyed bandit uh i thought it was a applicable name just off the sense of uh the sweetness of the green eyed bandit draws a lot of people in so i made a belgian trapel and uh that belgian trapel is one that like uh, I haven't looked at the sales reports. Are they moving okay? It well, honestly, I was surprised. It came it came out hot out the gates. I think um, it is, and you know, I think the most probably the the best thing that we did um, was that we moved to sixteen taps versus when we had ten. Mm-hmm. So I think now it gives us a better ability to say, okay, if you want to have a Belgian on, you know, an ESB, something that's like less of a you know a name you still have a lot of space for the ipas the new england's the triples the sours the stuff that you know the more flashy stuff it gives us a better opportunity to get a wide range i mean obviously Mm -hmm. you know i know that you were looking at our you know page earlier it's like you got a lot of different styles out there and that's probably the biggest compliment i would say that we get from customers when they come in is i love that you have x you know like they love the fact that we have something like that on tap because they won't find it anywhere else. They're like, yeah, I go to a place and they have, you know, nine IPAs and it's like, you know, but we get people that come in and they're just like, what's your hazy? It's like, all right, 10 craft commandments. They don't even, they don't even look at the menu. Is it? Like, they what? walk in, what's your hazy? Is it hazy? Yep. I'll have one. And they want it. So yeah, you just, you kind of play the numbers, but yeah, I think it helps. Uh, and yeah, like, so like for me, like I want to do a lot of that stuff. Like I still haven't brewed an ESP. I, I, would love to brew at ESV, but market space and tap holdings don't tell me that ESV's move. And uh, it's quote unquote a brewer's beer. However, I think that a Belgian Trapel kind of feels that uh, bridge between the two sides. It is a uh, traditional uh, ale that speaks to yesteryear, but it fulfills that desire for me that wants to make something that like is uninterrupted by outside noise. It is a beer with all of its essence. I literally just told people this past weekend, I wish we saw more of those. Yeah, Uh, no, that's, uh, and that's the thing, right? To Devin's point, it's the, it's the brewer's beer. Like it's the stuff that, you know, like we don't go to places and it's like, yeah, give me this, you know, triple new England or this heavy sour or whatever it is. It's like, I just want a beer that tastes like beer. Yeah. That's, I, that's how it's changed. I, I guess my question to you, because when you talk about these beers that aren't necessarily the biggest sellers, those beers are big sellers for a brewery or a handful of breweries. Like when, when you say like a, a Belgian triple, like my mind thinks to Le Fendemann and final absolution. Like yep. that's when, when you're making your beer, are you testing yourself towards them as like the litmus test? Or are you saying this is what a Belgian triple in my eyes tastes like? Like, is it a mixture of both? Like, how do you, how do you judge that? I want to play it as close to the T as possible. Right. So if, forefather says this is what this beer should be represented as that's what it should be uh so 
when executing that Belgian triple, it was imperative for me to, I, not to say that I was making a clone, but I wanted it to taste like all those other ones, right? Like, uh, if you like that style of beer, then you can also have it here that we make in house, right? So, um, for lack of a better term, yeah, like you're going and making a clone of your forefather, however, you want to go and try to do it justice, you know? I think when you're talking about specific styles, for example, a, a IPA, um, you know, there's a thousand ways to make an IPA, but when, when people, brewers even talk about IPAs, they think of too hard. Like that's one of the first beers that they're going to, to come up with when they think of, um, an amber ale, they might come up with Bell's Amber. They might come up with the original fat tire. Um, you know, it, I think it's okay to be not necessarily a clone. Cause obviously you're putting in your own, you know, you're choosing your hops, you're choosing your yeast, you're choosing your, your boil temps and all that. Um, but when you're making something true to style, like a final absolution, I think, uh, it's important to be close to a clone because when someone comes and they see a triple in my mind, at least they're like, Oh, this is going to be like final absolution. And I think that mentality is always going to be there. Um, I, I, I'm, do you agree with that statement? That mentality is it? Am I, am I in the wrong? Yeah, yeah, no, like uh, I do agree because uh, it took me about fourteen months to like appreciate the sense of like these aren't clones; these are our renditions, right? Like we are brewing beer. You're, 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 you were having imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I think that is a beautiful way to put it. I was having imposter syndrome. I felt like we we opened up a brewery and I was playing the hits. You weren't uh, brewing a triple. You were brewing a final absolution. Exactly. So yeah, for us, I kind of internalized it in the sense of I don't want people to think that I'm trying to do something that they did across the street or down the block or you know a couple miles uh, down the road. I thought that was going to reflect on me as a uh, imitation of a brewer instead of being like, no, 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 no. Like you can still do that, but if you're going to do it, do it at a high level. And that's where like the confidence comes into play. Right. You're talking about uh, the open landscape of any individual that can come and try your beer versus a brewer who doesn't want to, be uh i don't know um exposed as a fraud that's a very interesting way to look at things because i i never really thought about it that we want beers that are true to style but we want you to be different from everybody else at the same time yeah the balance of achieving both it's, it's a tough space to live in and i think i probably internalize that a little bit more than most people uh just because of my existence in this thing. So like finding that we can be successful with any beer that's executed well, then furthers my belief that we could go and do a beer. And it's not like, Oh yeah, this tastes just like absolutely no. Like, no, this is Arctic circles, Belgian bandit. That's a good trouble. Well, as we get into the final uh, time here at Better on Draft, before we give you the opportunity to tell us where you guys are located, where they can find your beer, uh, we do a final question segment where everyone asks one final question, something fun, lighthearted, easy to answer, hopefully easy to answer. So we're going to pass it to Wendy. Wendy, what is your final question for this evening? I'm going to break the rules and ask two questions. One, what time do you open on Sunday? <laughs> noon. High noon. High noon. Sometimes right. 1147. Sometimes the door will be open at 11.15. You never know. <laughs> and that triple's on tap right now? Oh, yeah. Right. That it is. Okay. So I might see you on Sunday. Um, my question is, what is the favorite beer that you have made so far? Uh, well, I mean, I speak partially the Layman's Brown, uh, which is currently on tap. I mean, that's... Uh, it's it was it's a beer made for me and my taste. Um, so yeah, you did I did say on episode five you love a brown ale. So I did. I was I was very upfront with that, and I I still stick to that. Whether it's that or I found my you know peanuts and cracker jacks by the mitten, I've got that in the fridge too. So that's uh, that's one I go to. But yeah, I would say that's probably um, 
probably it. I did actually surprising like from the first time I tried that that raspberry chocolate cider. I mean, even though I'm not a big like sweet guy, just something about it just hit it hit right. Um, and yeah, so I mean, more recently, it's probably a couple of mine for sure. Uh, favorite beer. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I uh, was visiting, and this isn't even one of our beers. Uh, I was over there talking to my guy Jeff at Loaded Dice. They made this uh, lager called Light Show, and it's fire. Like, I can think, drink 37 of those in one <laughs> sitting. Uh, it's just an easy drinking lager. Uh, but inside of our own house, to answer our question, like, that Green Eyed Bandit, it's one of those. Like, people spoke. I tried to deny it. I felt like a fraud making it. I was like, it's a blonde ale with honey and green tea. It can't be that great. And then I come back around to it. I'm like, hey, yeah, it tastes pretty good. <laughs> it's an easy drinking beer. It's a blonde ale that you can drink at any time of year. So, yeah, uh, Arctic Circles, Green Eyed Bandit and House is the one that like I want to see run into the sky. Dan, what's your final question? All right. Similar type of question. Devin, you might have already answered this, but it is for both of you. Um, what is the one style of beer you haven't made yet that you want to make? Uh, I, I mean, you go for well, yes. I mean, <laughs> I, think, I, think we, I think we know what you want to do. Right. Um, like, that boy was the ESB. <laughs> it might sit on tap for nine months, but fuck it. We're here now. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I think we've done a pretty good job uh, spinning the wheel. Half of Vice in this case. Oh, this yeah, that's wasn't true. Happy. Back I in haven't the day, made a happy yet. yet and we do get asked that question a lot. Very frequently. You guys going to make a happy? And I, I need to make the uh, Yeti heffy. Yeah, it's been a long time since so I had a good one. So, yeah, yeah. We, we, I could use one. You actually said those exact words on our show two and a half years ago, that it's been a while <laughs> since you've had a heffy. So it's been a while, a long while. So it's even been a longer while <laughs> right. since I've had a good heffy. Right, still working on it. <laughs> You know, maybe for your, your little beta testing, instead of, you know, going something really, really crazy, maybe you do something just a little bit more uh, humble. A, a humble heffy? A humble, there you go. I wasn't looking for go. the alliteration. Oh, I was just looking for, uh, uh, you know, something that's not necessarily too over the top. You know, you don't need 84 adjuncts to have a good beer. You just need a good beer. Uh, and there's th- Those definitely sneak in. Yeah, for sure. occasionally. I, I think ultimately, like uh, what that sort of uh, beta test series is there for it, and it sucks to say it, but it's a uh, move the needle beer, right? Like if I drop an ESB tomorrow for Thursday beta test, it'll be their next Thursday. <laughs> it'll be their next Thursday, right? So like it, it's a uh, sucks in that sense. I would love to do a small batch of it, but ultimately, like it wouldn't do us much good to drop a traditional German lager <laughs> to uh, a small batch. I don't know, man. The Heffy. I mean, I've gotten enough questions. I think we could uh, I think we could move it. Brewing a Heffy this summer, boys. It's happening. And I'll Wendy. Be there. <laughs> All right. My final question before we let you go. I have uh, three questions. I guess it's going to be t- between both of you. Uh, question number one, who would win between uh, either of you in beer pong? Ooh. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's been a long time. I got dust. I got dusted off. But if 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 it's a flick of the wrist at beer plug, he's gonna run me off the court. If it's a basketball court, no chance. Yeah, he's he's gonna, he's gonna <laughs> like, take me out. I, I'm terrible at beer plug. <laughs> terrible. All right, number two, cornhole. Who would win between the two of you? This guy. I, yeah, I still shoot over. He, he does. He does the basketball basketball shot. Um, <laughs> you know. So I'm I'm trash at both. <laughs> I apparently do a lot of drinking is is really what that comes down to. Well, I guess this doesn't help for the third question. What about a beer chug? Just a regular old chug. Oh no, that might be that might be him though. I'm less of a beer chug. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Like uh I, I know how to open the throat, you know? Oh yeah. All right. Arctic Circle Brewing, where are you guys located at? I I I just I just wasn't gonna... she just went right into the wrap up there. <laughs> yes, yes, <sorry. laughs> Arctic That's Circle right. located uh 23 mile in Gratiot, uh northeast Macomb County, right off of I-94. Yeah. Uh yeah, beautiful Macomb County, Michigan. Days so, yeah, open, def- seven days. Uh Wednesday through Saturday or Sunday. Excuse me. Yeah. Wednesday through Sunday. Wednesday through Sunday. Social medias. AC Brewing Co. Find us on all 
all channels. Um, Ooh, and uh, courteous plug to my TikTok account that yep. I started recently. I occasionally do a dance yep. uh, here and there, and we were we catch it on TikTok. Uh, it is AC Brewer underscore uh, AC underscore Brewer. I want to add you right now. Spread the love. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that is going to do it for Better on Draft. You can find us, Better on Draft, on Twitter, Untapped, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, Facebook, all the social medias. That's at Better on Draft. Of course, our website, betterondraft.com. You can find Arctic Circle Brewing as well as the 400 other breweries, meteries, and cideries on the Michigan Brewery Map app. That is free for you to download on Android and iOS. That is. <laughs> Download, yeah, download, 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 download the app. Download, I have download. it. I use it all the time. MIBeerMap.com. And no matter what you think of your beer, we think it's better on draft. Better on draft. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>